Now, if I was to say to you, um, I know Bill Cook. Oh, man. <laughs> what a blessing. If I was to say to you, I, I know Bill. <laughs> This is the Bill Corner over here, <laughs> or Bill Turner. But if I never talked to him, ever, would you, would you think that I really know him? Or, or if I said, yeah, I, I know Bill, and then Bill said, you know, I, he says he knows me, but I've never talked to him. <laughs> then what would you th you'd think that I really did not actually have a relationship with Bill? I know who he is, I know his name, but I, you know, I don't really have any any relationship to him or with him. And then, if if every time I saw Bill, the only thing I asked from him is, says, "Can you give me a dollar?" Every single time I talked to him, I just said, "Can you give me a dollar? Will you give me a dollar? Do you have a dollar? Will you give me a dollar? Do you have a dollar bill? I need a dollar bill." If that's all I ever said to Bill, at some point or the other, Bill is like, "You know what? Don't talk to me anymore. <laughs> I don't want to." I want to hear that from you. Prayer is the fruit of a relationship. And in our series that we've called Foundations, this morning we're going to begin, at least, exploring the topic of what is prayer. And uh, whenever I teach about prayer, I realize that no matter how much I talk about prayer, really, the only way really to learn about prayer uh, is to pray. And uh, so it would, it would serve me right, serve us all right, if we, I just pulled the plug on this sermon and said, let's just pray for the next 45 minutes. And it'd probably be the best thing that we could, we could do. And don't be surprised if I try that one of these days. Prayer is best learned by praying. It's as simple as that. And if you're... If you're a new Christian, if you haven't been a Christian for very long, you might look at prayer and say, gee, you know, I don't even, I don't even know where to begin. I don't even really, I guess you're supposed to talk to God, right? You know, I don't, I don't know what to do. And then, then kind of the flip side of that is if you've known the Lord for a while, sometimes our prayers can kind of descend into kind of a mindless formality where we just walk through the motions of prayer without any real, uh, I guess what I would call pathos, you know, no real feeling, no emotion of, of any kind. We just kind of shoot up mindless requests to God and just hope that he comes through for us this time. And, but at the core of prayer is that relationship. The core of prayer is a relationship. I am in a relationship with another being. What does that mean? If you're, if you're married, if you have a significant other, one of the things that you delight in, I hope you do, I do, in, in my marriage, I delight in being able to talk with my wife. And one of the things that I love to do, and if you're a good husband, you'll do this, when your wife gets home at the end of her work day, you say to her, honey, how was your day? And you've heard me say this before. How was your day, honey? You shut off the TV, you lay down whatever it is that you're doing, and you give her your full attention as long as she talks. <laughs> the girls are all laughing and the guys are going, what? <laughs> ask a man how his day was. He says, fine. <laughs> you ask a woman how her day was. <laughs> Men, just let them go. Let them run. Just let them say anything they want to say. And, uh, and I love listening to, to Deb tell me about her, how her day was. But we sure don't treat God that way, do we? You know, we don't ever ask God, how was your day today? We don't ever ask God, what do you, what do you have to say to me today? It's always, Lord, help! Help! You know, here's what I need. Here's what you have to do for me, and you got to do it now. Wow, there's an awful lot of talk about prayer. Heck, in the United States of America, which it's a miracle that we still have it, we have a national day of prayer. And uh, and whenever 
things get a little wild and woolly in the world, you hear people talk about, you know, we're just calling on people to pray. We need people to pray. And it's like, okay, that's great. And, and, and virtually every religion in the world has some element of prayer uh, as a part of that religion. But, you know, the thing that I, I begin to ask myself and, and some other people is, you know, who are you praying to? You know, I, 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 I know I've told you this story before. My very first trip to Thailand, we, we were taking a tour of the Grand Palace in Bangkok, and they led us into this incredibly ornate uh, Buddhist temple. And we had a tour guide, and so one of the guys in our group, and his name was Bill. <laughs> and, uh, and Bill said to the tour guide, he said, uh, do you, do you pray? And the guy says, oh, yes. And he said, uh, who do you pray to? And the guy says, I, well, I pray to Buddha. Bill said, so where's Buddha? And the guy says, oh, Buddha's, Buddha's dead. And Bill says, you ever get an answer? And the guy goes, eh. And I thought that's prayer for most people. And that's even prayer for some Christians. You ever get an answer? Eh. My view is God always answers our prayers every single time. It's not always what you want. It's not always how you want. It's not always when you want. But God never ignores the prayers of his children. Who is everybody praying to? I don't know. I don't know who they're praying to, but I know who I'm praying to. So let's take a minute and let's do the formality part, okay? And the formality before we get to Matthew chapter 6 is defining prayer Technically, so uh, you, on your handout, you'll notice that you, under prayer defined, you got a whole bunch of references. I'm just going to blow through those, and I'll explain them as I go along. So, prayer defining prayer is a little bit silly, I think. It's like trying to define breathing. What are you breathing? Okay, define breathing. Well, it's breathing. You know, <laughs> you breathe. <laughs> you inhale, exhale. That's that's what you do. You breathe, and uh, and. So it's, but I'll give you the definitions I got anyways. This is from Easton's Bible Dictionary for all you junior Bible scholars out there. If you have an Easton's Bible Dictionary, you'll find this there. <coughs> Prayer is conversation with God. I like that. Conversation. You see that word? Conversation. Conversation's got two sides to it, doesn't it? It's talking and listening. So prayer is conversation with God. Listen to this. It's the communion of the soul with God. I like that. The communion of the soul with God. Listen to this. It's the communion of the soul with God, not in contemplation or meditation, but in direct address to him. I like that. Prayer may be oral, verbal, out loud, or mental, just from within your head, directing your thoughts towards God, it may be occasional or constant. It may be spontaneous or formal. Let us pray. Could be any of those things. It is beseeching the Lord, Exodus 32, 11, pouring out the soul before the Lord, 1 Samuel 1, 15, praying and crying to heaven, 2 Chronicles 32, 20, seeking unto God and making supplication, Job chapter 8, verse 5, drawing near to God, Psalm 73, uh, verse 28, or bowing the knees, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. It is all of those things. Now, here's from another Bible dictionary called the New Bible Dictionary. I guess the old one wasn't good enough anymore. So we've got a new Bible dictionary, and I like this. Listen to this. In the Bible, prayer is worship that includes all the attitudes of the human spirit in its approach to God. I like how it says that it, it begins with worship. Prayer begins with worship. You've probably heard me say this here before. As a matter of fact, I did a whole series on worship uh, the beginning of this last year. Worship begins with the recognition of who God is. That's what worship, that's the beginning of worship. It's not, we think, well, worship is the songs we sing before the sermon, right? No, 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 it's not, not. You can worship God without songs. You can sing songs and not worship God. It is, begins with the recognition of who God is. Who are you dealing with here? God himself. So I like that. 
prayer is worship that includes all the attitudes of the human spirit in its approach to God. The Christian worships God when he adores, confesses, praises, and supplicates him in prayer. Listen to this. I believe this is true. This highest activity of which the human spirit is capable may also be thought of as communion with God as long as due emphasis is laid upon the divine initiative a man prays because God has already touched his spirit I like that the highest activity of which the human spirit is capable think about this think about this when we pray we are dealing directly with God the creator of everything seen and unseen. He created all the universes, all of the galaxies, all the stars. He created you. And now you are turning your attention to him to engage him in a conversation. The highest activity of which the human spirit is capable. We might also say that relationship carries with it the idea of communication between two parties. That's why I started off using that example. If there's no communication, there's no relationship. So when we're saved, when we're born again by God's Spirit, Christ moves into our heart, and, that, and it is completely natural for us then to talk to him. And, I, and I've talked with many uh, unbeliever about this they say okay so you're hearing voices in your head and then talking back to them <laughs> and I'm like pretty much yeah <laughs> yeah I'm talking to God and I believe that God talks to me we'll talk about that sometime it's natural for me to pray if for no other reason just to thank him just to thank him for who he is and what he has done for me. It's natural to do that. Now, we don't, we're also going to notice here uh, in our text in Matthew chapter 6 that prayer is assumed. Matter of fact, it says in Matthew chapter 6 verse 5, and when you pray. Jesus doesn't say, if you pray. He says, when you pray. So it's assumed that you're going to. Why would he make an assumption like that? Because he's a person. And he wants to live in relationship to you who happens to be another person. Is there anybody here this morning that is not a person? Okay, we're all good then. Jesus is a person who wants to live in relationship with, with you who is a person. So prayer is assumed. It's natural that you're going to have communication with him. Now at creation back in Genesis... Man was made to live in daily, regular communion with God. God was present in his creation, and man had conversations with him. It's fascinating to see the kind of communion that man had in the very beginning with God. And then, through the fall, that communion was severed. There was distance put between man and God. And prayer is one of those elements that helps restore that distance. Because when we pray, we're just having a conversation with somebody and they're right here. Where's God? Right here. Right here, all the time. He's not a million miles away, he's right here. And well, we have communion with him when we pray. And, and when, we, when we turn our full attention to the Creator, this is what we do when we pray. We disengage our attention from other things, from the things that are bothering me, from the things that are weighing me down, from the things that I'm rejecting. Whatever it is, I'm disengaging my attention there so that I can re-engage my attention directly to, with, and on my Creator who saved me. Now that in itself is kind of an epic task because there's lots of stuff on my mind. And there's lots of stuff that weigh me down. Lots of things that weigh me down. Better grammar. And so when, when I turn my attention to God in prayer, man, my head is just going a million miles an hour. 
And sometimes when I, honestly, sometimes when I go to God in prayer, I just spill out all of this stuff, like I just vomit out all of this stuff to him. And then after a while, I'm like, sorry about that. You know, let me just slow down here just a little bit, Lord. And thank you for being patient with me. And okay, now let's just have a conversation here. Jesus, one of the great trademarks, characteristics of his life was prayer. And he would frequently, we were just talking about this in the Thursday night study in our studies through the Gospel of Mark, that Jesus would frequently go off to isolated places and pray. We talked about how we live in a place here where getting off to a quiet place to pray is easy to do. You go for a walk out on the trail or get up on a bluff top or up Prisma Creek or whatever you want and just walk and just pray. Just commune with God. Jesus prayed frequently. And, and you got to remember that all of the, the apostles, they were all Jewish guys raised in the Jewish faith and had a good working knowledge of what they believed. They demonstrated that. And prayer was a part of the Jewish faith. But when they watched Jesus pray, they saw something else. And when they watched him pray, it was like nothing that they'd ever seen or heard before. So that at one point, it's actually in uh, Luke chapter 11, verse 1, Jesus' apostles came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. Because whatever you're doing, it ain't like what we're doing. I grew up in the church. Most of you guys, anybody here grow up going to church as a kid? Yeah, probably most of us did. And I can remember the prayers of the ministers and uh, they were so tremendously formal. They kept saying things like thee and thou and wherefore. And I'm like, you know, okay, <laughs> whatever. It, may, it had no significance to me whatsoever. And, and so I, I go to a church, the church I got saved in, and I listen to the pastor there pray, and it just sounded so normal. To me, it sounded almost uh, conversation. You know what it sounded like? It sounded like he was talking to somebody that he knew. That's what it sounded like to me. It's fascinating. I didn't get it. So Jesus' disciples come to him and they say, Lord, teach us to pray. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 5. And when you pray, there it is, there's that imperative, not if you pray, but when you pray. When you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the city. He said it like that. They love to pray, that's in the Hebrew, they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward, but you when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. That's if you think you could just chant the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again, like it's going to mean something. Don't use vain repetitions, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. If I just say it enough times, he's going to hear me, right? Therefore, do not be like them, verse 8. For your Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. The model prayer, oftentimes referred to as the Lord's Prayer, which technically it really isn't. 
Actually, if you want to read the Lord's Prayer, read John chapter 17. That's properly the Lord's Prayer. This is, again, Jesus does this teaching here on prayer in response to his disciples saying, Lord, teach us to pray. And when they asked Jesus to teach them to pray, he told them this. Now, and I, I'm one of those that doesn't ever believe that this prayer was intended to be the prayer. If you just pray this prayer, everything will be fine. And lots of people do that. And lots of churches do that. Now, we will all stand and we will pray the Lord's Prayer. It's even been put to music, and, and lots of people do that, and they find great comfort in that, and that's fine. That's fine. I'm not saying that's a, that's a wrong thing to do. I've prayed the Lord's Prayer many, many times, and that's, that's awesome. But rather, I see this prayer as a model for prayer. In other words, what can we glean from this that we can apply to our prayer life? If, if Jesus intends this to be the prayer that, that's the only prayer that we ever pray, I don't see that anywhere else in the entire rest of Scripture. So if this is intended to be a model for us, let's use this prayer to teach us how to pray. That make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Crickets, crickets. Bueller, <laughs> Bueller, anyone? Little response once in a while is good. It's all right. I know we're not like a full-blown Pentecostal church, but little feedback once in a while is okay. I'm just letting you know. Okay, let's take it apart like this. This is under point number two, letter A. You have that in your handout. Uh, jot it down. Underline it in your Bible. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Jesus' introduction on prayer begins with worship and relationship. That's where it begins. Worship and relationship. It's relationship because our, he's our heavenly father. He's not the big bully in the sky. He's our, he's our heavenly father. But it's worship because he is holy. He's God. You know, we're not talking to the neighbor next door. We're not just talking to Bill. And he's very neighborly. We're, not, it, that we're talking with God, the creator of all things seen and unseen, God who saved your soul, God who sent his son to die for you, and he's holy, he's holy, he's holy, and we can't ever forget that. This focuses us on the character of God, who it is that we're dealing with. Remember, that's the beginning of worship. But both acknowledgments are important. The acknowledgment of his holiness, his name is hallowed. Hallowed simply means holy. Even just his name is holy. So it's important to understand who we're dealing with. But we also can't lose sight of the fact that he's our father in heaven. Our father. Now, I, I know I've told you this before. When I got saved, the church that I went to told me that my heavenly father loved me unconditionally. And I had no difficulty at all understanding that concept. And the reason why is because I had such a great dad. My dad loved me unconditionally. And I knew because of who my dad was, I knew that I could call on my dad whenever I needed him and that he would be there for me. I knew that. My dad disciplined me, although not very much. But I knew beyond any shadow of any doubt that my dad loved me. And he loved me unconditionally. There was no question about that in my mind. Not everybody had a dad like that, right? right? So sometimes when we say your heavenly father loves you, maybe that doesn't always make a lot of sense to you. Or maybe there's a slight disconnect where you think, okay, intellectually I understand that, but emotionally there's no connection for me. Let me, let me say that God, your heavenly father, is everything that your earthly father was not. As good as my dad was, my dad was not the perfect dad. And I know that my heavenly father is the perfect dad. So if you've never had this kind of a dad, you can now. Your heavenly father can and will be for you everything that your earthly father was not. Now, let me say this too. He's our heavenly father. Hallowed is his name. He's holy. I've used this illustration before. I'm going to use it again because I think it works. When we pray to God, 
If you've been born again by the Spirit of God, we are praying to God as our Father. Now, lots of people pray. And there's lots of people that have not been born again by God's Spirit, and they pray as well. Who are they praying to? Well, they may think that they're praying to God, and, and they are, I guess, I think. But there's a difference, and here's the difference, is God is the king. And in God's kingdom, there are subjects of the king, and there are children of the king. Who's got the greater access to the king, the children or the subject? The children do. Because even though the child is a subject in the king's kingdom, the child has the privilege of crawling up on the king's lap and calling him daddy. The subjects don't. Now, the subjects can become the children of the king. And all that is required is that they be born again by his spirit. That's all that is required. But for those of us that have been born again by God's spirit, we are the children of the king. So when we pray, we don't pray to the big boogeyman in the sky. We don't pray to this king that could at any moment say, off with your head. We crawl up onto the lap of our Heavenly Father who loves us unconditionally, who is everything that our earthly father is not, who never rejects us. He doesn't beat us. He doesn't lock us in closets. He doesn't take off his belt and whip us with it. It's not our God. But we can crawl up on his lap and we can say, I need some help. And he says, I know. It's okay. So our prayers begin with the acknowledgement that God is holy and that he's worthy of worship and yet at the same time he's still our father. He's still our daddy. Everything that our earthly daddy was not our daddy that we can crawl up on his lap and ask of him anything. Anything. People ask me sometimes, well what can I pray about? Anything. Remember, all you're doing is having a conversation. You're having a conversation with God, your Heavenly Father, the one who made you and the one who saved you. You're just having a conversation with Him. You can tell Him anything you want. It's almost as if, and I know it's really not anywhere in Scripture, it's almost as if God wants you to sit down and God says to you, how was your day? And He's not watching TV and He doesn't have to put down His book or His paper. He's listening. And he'll listen to anything and everything you have to say. Letter B. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is acknowledgement and acquiescence. I love that word. Acquiescence. Or to acquiesce. That simply means to give up, to surrender, or to submit. That's what acquiesce means I give up, I surrender, I quit. Look, there's some of you here, perhaps today, that need to acquiesce to God. You need to surrender to God. You've been fighting Him, you've been holding off, yeah, yeah, I believe in God and everything, but I, you know, I don't, I'm, that whole born-again thing kind of freaks me out a little bit. You know, I just don't want to go there, I'm not ready, I don't want to. You need to acquiesce. It's time to give up. Just, just look, I'm telling you, just give it up. You're not going to this. You're not going to win. <laughs> you're not going to win. He's going to wear you down. He's going to love you until you just give up. That's what he does. It's after, after a while, it's like, okay, all right, all right, all right. I surrender. When we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, or when we pray things like that, what we're doing Here's what we're doing. We acknowledge that God not only has a will, but a plan to implement that will. We, we're asking him that as your will is done in heaven, and how is God's will done in heaven? I'm, I'm thinking perfectly. God always, everything that God plans in heaven always goes the way that God plans it. Now we're asking him to do that same thing here. Lord, we want your will to be perfectly done here and all that that means. Be careful praying that. All that that means. Because it may not mean what you think it means. 
I do not think that means what you think it means. Richard Brother. <laughs> Princess Bride, for the reference. So then, so then, when, when we're praying, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it, in, as it is in heaven, what we're doing is we're saying, Lord, here's all of my prayers. I'm giving you all of my prayers. Here's everything I can think of to, to say to you, to talk to you about. Now, would you please sort them out for me? Because I don't know what is your will and what is not your will. All I know is what is my desire and what is in my heart. And so I just pour out my heart to you, Lord. I used to sing a song like that. I'm going to have to track that song down. I pour out my heart. I pour out my... It was in a song. A great song. We pour out our hearts to God and we say, Look, I, I don't know what to do with all of this. Look, look. Do you know what to do with everything in your life? Do you know what to do with all of your thoughts and all of your feelings and all of your emotions? Do you know what to do with all of it? Right, you don't. But he does. And so when we lift it all up to him, when we pray to him, we're saying, Lord, here's everything. Here's all that I've got. Crying out. <laughs> Crying out to him. That's what's going on back there. And we're saying, Lord, I don't know what to do with all of my life. I don't know what to do with everything in it, but you do. And so, Lord, I'm asking you, would you please sort these things out? And, and Lord, if I'm asking anything that is contrary to your will, don't do it. Right? Oh, that's, that's a tough one. But, you know, it, there, there are some elements within the Christian church in America that would tell you that that is not a prayer of faith. You got to pray in faith. Because you don't pray in faith believing that God's going to do it. He's not going to do it. I think that's pathetic, personally. I take my cues from Jesus because he's the one that said, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. That works for me. Because what I'm asking for may not be the right thing. It may not be the best thing. It may not be in line with his will. So really, when I'm praying, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done, what I'm saying is, Lord, bring me into alignment with you and with your will in my life. I want to be in alignment with you. So here's everything I've got. Here's my desires, here's my thoughts and my concerns and my burdens. And Lord, I don't know what to do about this. And I'm, I really need your help with this. And I'm lifting it all up to you. And then I'm saying, okay, Lord, here it all is. Now help me sort it out. Help me sort it out. Lord, I'm, I, I just need you to do that for me. I'm, I want to acquiesce to his will. Whatever it is that you want to do with this, Lord, I'm good with that. Here's what I want to do, but if you don't want to do that, then I won't do it. I don't want to do this, Lord, but if you want me to, I will. Here's what I think ought to happen with this, Lord. If that's not what ought to happen, I'm good with whatever you think ought to happen. That make sense? Blink once for yes, twice for no. And in our acquiescence, in our submitting, in our surrendering to him, what we're saying, what we're acknowledging is, Lord, you have a will that is far better than mine. Your plan for my life is far better. I've told you guys before, I had a plan for my life before I was saved. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. And then I got saved. And I realized that God had a will for my life, and I decided to follow his will. And what I, what I realized in retrospect is I look back, and I was aiming so low. <laughs> what I wanted was just so pathetically small and stupid and short-term. And, I, you know, God's got such an amazing thing for you and for me. I mean, I am just so good just saying, Lord, your will, not my own. But I'm not saying that's easy either. Right? I'm not saying that's easy. 
Because sometimes God's will for you and for me includes very difficult things and even painful things. And you have to say, Lord, if you want to take me through the pain, if the pain is the way that I have to go, Lord, then I'll, I'll, then I'll go. David prayed, you know, Lo, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I got to tell you, friends, I, I feel like I've walked through the valley of the shadow of death. And I didn't like it at all. But I got to tell you, he was there. He was right there with me. So if that's the way we got to go, Lord, then let's go. If it's going to be the pain, then let's do the pain. I'll, I'll do that with you. Because you promised that you're going to be there with me. I want to do your will no matter what. You got to think about that before you pray that, right? Before you pray, not my will, but yours be done. Before you pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, in my life, as it is in heaven. Before you pray that, you got to think, don't you? Think about what you're saying. Then he says, give us this day our daily bread, in verse 11. What we're doing then is we're asking God to meet our daily needs. Note the word daily. Not weekly, not monthly, not semi-annually, not quarterly, daily. Let me ask you this, friends. Have you ever had to live day to day? You got enough for today, but you're not too sure about tomorrow. I've been darn close to that, and I didn't like it. Because what I like is I like being able to go to my refrigerator or my pantry and have a choice. I like to be able to go in there and say, what do I want to eat now? <laughs> I could do this, 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 or this. And I've told you before, if you've been to my house, you know this that if I never put another item of food into my house at all, I could eat for quite some time. It would get ugly at the end, but I could eat for a long time on, on the stuff that I got far more than my daily bread. But really what we're doing is we're asking God to meet our daily needs. And Lord, if it's got to be day to day, then I trust you for day to day. Now God's given a lot of us a lot more than our daily bread. Seriously, right? But if it's got to be day to day, okay. See, we're the ones that have created this life that requires such massive provision. You hear me? We're the ones that have created this life that requires such massive provision. God didn't create it like that. He said, I'll take care of you every day. I'll make sure that every day you have exactly what you need. And we're like... That's all right, I've got it. I just, I just, you know, I was a new leaf up there, you know, and I just got a whole bunch of stuff. So, and I spent, you know, three entire paychecks getting enough food at new leaf for groceries this week. You guys see the cost of food lately? Yes. <sighs> God plans on providing for you today. He's going to meet your needs. If they're not being met, maybe they're not needs. Or maybe they're needs that you've created for yourself and he didn't create them for you. Got to think about that. We was talking about that here a while ago. Sometimes really what we need to do is rearrange our life so that we can live a little bit simpler instead of living quite so complex and burdensome. Letter D. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Here sin is pictured as a debt. And a sinner is a debtor. So by asking for forgiveness, we acknowledge that we're sinners and that we are pleading with God to forgive us and that we are then willing to turn and forgive others who sin against us. <coughs> Let's not talk about that. No, we have to. We got, we got to talk about it. How many of you have ever sinned? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many of you want God to forgive you? Yeah. And you want God to forgive you now. And you want him to forgive you unconditionally. And you want him to be gracious and gentle to you. 
for your failures. And that's what you want. And God says that when you repent, that means you acknowledge your sin, you acknowledge that it is a sin, and that you turn from that and say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave that behind. I'm not going to go that way anymore. I'm going to turn away from that sin. I'm going to go another direction altogether. When you repent, that's what repent means. God says, he'll forgive you. And not only will he forgive you, I love this, he forgets the sin that you committed. I like that. So then, that's what we want. Then he says that when we do that, that we are in turn supposed to forgive others in the same way that he forgives us. You see that? That's how that works. We receive the forgiveness from him, and that kind of forgiveness that we receive from him, that's how we forgive other people. And we always forgive everyone just like that, right? Darn. Now, we're going to come back to that later on. And again, I'm not going to apologize. We're not going to get to the end of this here today. We're going to come back to that later on because Jesus adds an addendum onto the end of this, this teaching on prayer. And that addendum is, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. And if you don't, he won't. Oops. Yeah, I want forgiveness. But in order to receive that forgiveness, I have to be forgiving in the same manner that I am forgiven. Uh. Yeah. So, now you got to ask God something else. You got to ask Him, Lord, will you reveal to me, in me, any unforgiveness that I'm harboring towards anything or anyone else. I know people that harbor unforgiveness against God. Hey, you know, God let my spouse die. God let my mom die. I can't believe that a God of love would do this. I'm holding this against him. My, I'm holding my unbelief against him. People don't forgive God. Oh, you know, I'll... I'll I'll never forgive my parents for the way that they raised me. I'll never forgive them for that. Ever. Ever. Guess you don't want forgiveness from God then, do you? I'll never forgive them. I loved them and they betrayed me. I'll never forgive them for that. You ever heard people say that? Don't acknowledge this, but have you ever said that? Have you ever said that you would never, ever forgive? I don't know what Bible you're reading, but the one that I'm reading says, if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And I want him to forgive mine. That means i got to be a person that is willing, willing, I'm not saying it's easy, willing to forgive. Doesn't mean we forget, we can't erase the memories, can we? I'll always know what they did to me. But I can relinquish my grasp on that. I don't have to hold that against them any longer because as long as I hold it against them, they own me. They hold sway over my life because of my refusal to forgive them. Does that make sense? And that's... Unforgiveness is one of the greatest cancers in the spiritual life. It will eat you alive. Oh, it, do, it doesn't bother me at all. I'll just never forgive them. There it is. You know how cancer starts? It's a cell. You know how big a cell is? Can't even see it with the naked eye. That's where cancer begins. Unforgiveness is like that. It's like a cancer. If you leave it alone, if you hold unforgiveness against one person, you'll hold it against somebody else. And then somebody else, and then somebody else. And before you know it, you'll have a whole raft of people that you don't forgive anymore. And it'll eat you alive from the inside out. We are pledging, we are pledging to forgive as we are forgiven when we pray. So when you ask God to forgive you, of your sins, and I ask God to forgive me of my sins, 
multiple times throughout every single day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. I, every time I'm asking him for forgiveness, I'm saying, Lord, forgive me of my sins so that I can in turn forgive others. God doesn't separate the two. As a matter of fact, he makes it conditional right there. Whew. Letter D, lastly. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen simply means, so be it. Or let it be just like that. It's an agreement. Yes, I agree with that. This is a plea for divine protection and deliverance. Because what we're confessing, when we ask God to do that for us, what we're saying is, Lord, I'm easily led astray, and I'm an easy victim of Satan's schemes. I'm easy. <laughs> you know, you, we don't need Satan to tempt us a whole lot. We're perfectly capable of getting in trouble all by ourselves. You would think, okay, well, you know, you know, Satan's really after me today. He's really getting me down. He may not be at all. You're, you're creating your own nightmare here. You know, we are our own worst enemies. Have any of you guys ever gotten yourselves in trouble? So when we're saying, Lord, Lord, protect me and deliver me, we're saying, look, I'm, I'm easily led astray. I understand, Lord. I don't always get it right. I, I'm, I'm easily tempted and I, and I wander off the straight and the narrow path. And, and, I, and I know that I get myself outside of your will. And I know that when I do that, Satan's always right there and ready to take advantage of my own stupidity. Lord, protect me and deliver me because I'm like a sheep that wanders. So keep me in close and tight. Because I wander off so easily. It's no, it's no mistake that in Scripture God refers to his people as sheep. You guys ever been around sheep? I used to have a good friend of mine. He grew up on a sheep farm. And he grew up raising sheep and shearing sheep and the whole thing. And I asked him. I asked him. I said, okay, God calls us sheep. I said, why do you think that is? He said, I'm not sure, but sheep are one of the dumbest animals on the earth. Thanks. They're crazy dumb. When, when, they, when they are grazing in a field, they'll pull up the grass by the roots and eat it. And guess what? If you pull up all the grass by the roots, nothing grows there. They'll eat until they can no longer walk. You have to lead them to where the water is so that they will drink. If they get big and fall over, they can't stand up any longer. You have to stand them back up again. They have no natural defenses. If a sheep is attacked, what does it do? Dies. It just dies. It's the bottom of the food chain. I mean, it's kind of embarrassing. But when God calls a sheep, as a matter of fact, if you've never read this book, I'll give you a good book recommendation from the pulpit this morning. It's called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. It's written by a guy that was a shepherd. And he examined Psalm 23 and wrote a whole book about it. It's a short book. It's <laughs> definitely worth reading. A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. Get the book. Read the book. We're acknowledging that we need protection every single day. That we wander off, we get ourselves into trouble, and only God can protect us and deliver us from the power of the evil one. Because Satan's always going to be there to trip you up and to make your life miserable. In addition to all the ways that we trip ourselves up and make ourselves miserable. You know what we like to say, if you're on a diet, you don't hang out at the bakery. Sometime you just got to steer clear of everything, and we're not good at that. But what we're also acknowledging, too, when we pray that, is we're acknowledging that God's kingdom is the kingdom that wins. He's, he's, there's no competition for God. It's not like God and the devil have to go two out of three falls. You know, if whoever gets the one in the submission hold first and taps out, you know, I mean, that's, that's not how it is. God, listen, God wins 
all the time. He is a 100% winning record. His side always wins. I've read the end of the book. He wins in the end, always. Whose side do you want to be on? I'm thinking this is the side that I want to be on. And as a sheep, this is the side I have to be on. Because I'm acknowledging that his kingdom is victorious. And he alone has the power to protect and deliver me. No one else does. I cannot protect myself. Each of these elements that we've looked at here is critical to a balanced prayer life. Again, I don't always pray these exact words that, you know, when Deb and I sit and pray at the end of the day, we don't sit down and say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. You've heard people pray that like that, right? You've been in church before like that, praying it like they're reciting names out of a phone book or something. Who are we talking to? What's on your heart? He's your dad. He's your heavenly father. Crawl up on his lap. Spill your guts to him. He's got big shoulders. You're not going to offend him. Don't worry. He's your dad. This guide, if you will, for prayer has the power to transform your prayer life. And the reason why is because Jesus said, do it like this. This is how he prayed. This is how we can pray. When his disciples said, how should we pray? He said, pray like this. So if we use this as a guide, as a model for our prayer life, your prayer life can be completely transformed. Where do you begin? Right at the beginning. Begin wrapping your head around the fact that you have a Heavenly Father in Heaven who loves you so much, is ready and willing to accept you right onto His lap right now to spill your guts to Him and let Him sort everything out for you. It's a good place to start, huh? I got an idea. Let's pray. Truly, you are our gracious, gracious Heavenly Father. And what a privilege, what a relief it is that we can bring to you anything and everything. We acknowledge who you are, our great God, the one and the only creator of all things. And yet you are the one that saved us. You are the one that's invited us in to be a part of your family so that you can be our dad. And that we can offer up to you from our hearts everything, every burden and every care and every pain, no matter how deep it's buried. The things that no one else knows, you know. And we can offer them all up to you and ask for your help. And you will. So Lord, teach us to pray. Help us to apply these things, at least to, to try to apply these things from this, this model of prayer that you've given us. And Lord, transform our prayer lives, that our prayer life, that our conversations with you, that our relationship to you would be daily and vital and real and living, not stale and formal. So remind us this day of who you are and that we can now live in relationship to you, talking to you and talking with you and hearing from you. Remind us of these things today, Lord, and we trust that you will because we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.